If you want to see more videos like this and support my efforts on Thor Inside here, where I cover my non-esports interests, then one of the best ways you can do is either subscribe to my Thor Inside Patreon in the description box below, or buy a serving of gamer subs, as well as all the delicious ones that are keto-friendly because they're sugar-free, they don't have loads of filler in, they dissolve really easily, they taste delicious, but nuanced flavor palette, not strong, and kind of chemically flavors are like the lemonade one, for example, as well as that Chemi Lime Sickles and favorite man they've also got teas like they've got an l-theanine one that's caffeine free and because it has l-theanine in helps you go to sleep it's called sleepy time check it out you can get 10 percent off with the code thorin t-h-o-r-a-n at gamesops.gg also i am going to do quite a few more videos on the side channel now now look the reason why i made the patreon is i can do them for fun but if i actually start making a bit more money yet it becomes a lot easier to set aside time to make more of the content so that's why i've been doing a bit more i've been doing some of the short ones too but i want to do some in-depth ones like this, so it's like a proper full-on thorin type video and so yeah we're going to go ahead and do it i also think this is actually a time where let's just say i won't go into why maybe i'll reveal why in the lifestyle channel on my discord in the future but i'm just a bit more focused right now I've got a little more a little bit more fuel so everyone who clicks on this video i'm going to assume has seen true detective season one if you haven't in a sense there'll be spoilers even though i'm not going to go like meticulously through the plot but it's just my way i want to talk about it as a holistic entity and i'm going to address many different aspects and you're going to wonder maybe why does it say a flawed gem i think within the story itself within some of the characters themselves and then later on when i talk about some of the elements that veer keyword veer let's say allegedly into the field of plagiarism or cribbing unduly or not really crediting main sources you almost certainly seem to have read yourself you've even admitted as much that's something that sours me a little bit on it but i've even got an interesting take on that by the way something i'll probably expand into a whole video itself one day actually because i did something similar about adaptation on this channel didn't i i think probably blew people's minds in a way so one of the key things is i really like this season now you notice it doesn't say true detective it says true detective season one right the others may as well not even be in the same series though they may as well just be called other shows like i don't know why that can't just be a different show well i do know why it's the way tv works by calling a sequel or something then people go and consume it who don't follow directors actors etc which is what i do now true it's written in part by some of the same well the same person but as i'll get to it on the pledges and thing that's not necessarily a good thing but we'll get to that so i do think this first one is excellent it is always hailed as one of the greats and a fan favorite but it is true prestige tv like each episode feels like a film it has top film actors in it and even the way it's paced, the way it's told, the level of budget seemingly, the way it's shot, it's really, really high-level prestige TV. This season can go against anything. It can go against The Wire's best seasons. Um, what are we talking about? Deadwood, early seasons of The Sopranos. You can go against, I mean, a lot of people don't get past the early ones, but like later seasons of The Shield, maybe. There's, there's a lot of great prestige TV out there, obviously, even though now... It's become something of a cynical medium, hence the later seasons of this show. This first season is a banger. Like, think about this. You have Matthew McConaughey, who's a massive film actor. He can go make millions of dollars in films. Yeah, now he's done the turn to be a bit more serious. In fact, then he was the romantic comedy guy more, wasn't he? I think his turn as Russ Cole, understandably, everyone hails. It's probably the best thing about this show, right? It's obviously an amazing performance. He just becomes that character um there's a little bit of himself in there but i actually don't think there's that much from listening to a lot of um interviews with him he's quite a christian guy he's kind of an upbeat guy if you don't know he has come from a, he's really not actually that character at all to me he just must have immersed himself in it now look i will credit completely before i looked into this yes it's very fascinating dialogue i even think that's one of the strengths of this series it has so many iconic things even that whole thing of like you know the press is going to be hell on you i'd suggest you unalive in minecraft you know all that's like there's some amazing lines in this some some great like back and forth obviously between marty and russ cole matthew mcconaughey is russ cole obviously what's great about this character is he's driven he has that righteous fury He's also, by the way, you'll notice, running from that clawing nihilism of like a, a, a yawning, gaping chasm that he's about to fall into where his soul should be. But you get to find out why that might be, etc. By the way, that's even an element I think people miss on this show is that he's actually compelled to do some of these things seemingly in part because it's the right thing, but also because he's lost everything. And it's sort of a way to like, here's the thing that people don't get. To me, it's a very interesting distinction. When horrible things happen to people, there's sort of two directions you can go. There's a spectrum. The two ends of the spectrum go like this. You can either go, this is horrible what happened to me, because it's external, mostly. That means that, like, the world and the things outside of me 
uh, bad because this happened to me. Therefore, I can or should do bad things because fuck it happened to me. You know, fair's fair. It's like a fucked up inverse golden rule. I guess it is the golden rule of the scenario, except you're not really liking it, right? So something like that. The other angle, I would say this is where like some very incredible people in human history come from. And I always try to veer this way myself is you can also then think, well, since it happened to me, I don't want it to happen to anyone else. In fact, it's even more important that I sort of heal from this and overcome it and then maybe guide others and help them and protect them. Now, what's interesting about his character is he walks that line and he veers across the spectrum, doesn't he? Because at times it does seem like, because he's got nothing, fuck it, yeah, load up on booze, <laughs> bring your friends. So, you know, you all know the teen spirit lines. I wasn't what I was intentionally going into. It just came out naturally because I was... I was one of the generation that was into that sort of music grunge, as it were. It's actually a fantastic genre, by the way. But he's someone where, yeah, there's a part of him who's like, right, fuck it, let's go out and do this. Let's kill these motherfuckers. Let's get rid of this scum, actually. But then there's another part of him that's also doing it because it's like, well, what's horrible that happened to me? Like, yeah, I don't want other people's children to be wrecked and their lives to be ruined, them to be fucked over in some way. And so he's always battling that, isn't he? It's like he has got a demon inside him and sometimes he's letting it out for good, but other times he's having to sort of battle it and try and hopefully overcome it and not let him consume him completely. And obviously the turn at the end implies he sort of rediscovers a soul, as it were, in hope. Because let's be real, this show, a downside I'll say is this. When I watched it, I was in this world, so it was okay. It's a mega black pill, this show. It's a amazing. I think even the implications people don't know are a crazy black pill at the end. Like, it tries at the end to make a turn, but you know what? It's not convincing, and there'll be more about that later. The reason why I also really loved the show when it first came out, because I was actually watching when it just came out. I think I watched, like, when season episode two would come out or something. I was Rust Core when I watched this show, when I watched this show, crucially. And because I had that sort of a rational materialist mindset bit more nihilistic, different person back then. I didn't I trust my instincts and my intuition and something more than just rational, bit raw rationality, etc. I thought everyone was a con man and cynic. And you all know the, the script. I'm sure many of you are stuck in that world right now. And I wouldn't wish it on you. I hope you find your way out. I hope you find your way to a different thing. You find that some of the areas that you looked in life, you were being too cynical. You actually hadn't experienced those things. You hadn't given yourself a chance. You haven't developed the things. I'll give you a very, very quick example. This is just an example. It's not something I recommend, right? There's a classic thing about the occult and it goes like this. Loads of people have bought occult books like Alistair Crowley books or Austin Spare, well, less of them, but yeah, the loads, obviously like witch books and stuff or they've read about like secret societies or they've even gone and done that stupid stuff like you buy the book that has all the secret rituals of the Golden Dawn or whatever. But what they do is they buy the book and first of all, you, you must know this by now, most people buy books and don't read them or they buy them and read them just so they can go, yes, I know all about that. And yes, um, uh, that was Enochian that he was doing that, but they don't ever do any of the things in the book, even though most of these books, by the way, for real, are practical guides. But here's the problem why. I'm actually about to reveal a secret of the occult here, which you're not really supposed to do with the occult, but I'm not in the occult. I've never taken an oath ever. And I would never advise anyone does it. It's something that I dabbled in, which I'll tell you, I wouldn't recommend it. And it's something that I then sort of found my way out of because I came from the occult aspect and I went into mysticism and the mythic sort of mindset, as it were, and sort of found a different way out of it and realized some of that was too dark. And basically, here's the secret. One of the reasons why, if you ever try some of those things, which most people don't, so as a result, they're going like, oh, it's nothing, or I just know that. And they're all just LARPers and fakers. One of the reasons why they won't get anywhere is most of it is based around having essentially a strong meditative capacity and ability to see things in your mind's eye. By the way, I would say my whole skill set of creativity, humor, even some of my... Um, ideas that I have that are really out there all come from the mind's eye, from the imagination. I actually consider that the most spiritual thing in the universe, seemingly. It's the most powerful thing. I don't know if it connects to something else. If there's a soul that comes out, I don't know what it is. It doesn't just seem like something inside of a brain though, and like grey, dead grey matter. <laughs> this is the memories of stuff. I don't I don't see that. I don't see it that way. So to me, actually, yeah, this is something where you have to develop that. And even then you have to do it in a very pointed way. Like essentially, this is why people who do like meditation just start out and say, this is boring or like, oh, I'm doing yoga. It's, it's hurting to sit like this. And you wonder why you hear those stories. Go look into it. Where people who become yogis and get good at yoga and yoga is a mixture of the postures sitting in the asana. And then once you've mastered the asana and you no longer feel the body, let it fall away, then you can focus the mind even more so. By the way, if you want a little cheat code, just go in a flotation tank. Once you learn to stay still and don't hit the edges, it'll start to happen spontaneously. And let's just say, if you were to put certain chemicals into your body and then get into one, you could blast off to 
outer space, as John Lilly's work would show. Go and look into it. But I would say, because most people have never developed that, they don't know that that's where later when they're seeing things, and then you imagine this thing, and then the angels, you know, doing that. You're going to go, man, nothing's happening. It's just imaginary. And then you're actually going to expect no joke because you've seen movies that physically into real reality, nuts and bolts, 3D reality, these things are going to spawn in and then start doing things. Listen, if that was what was going to happen, guys, life wouldn't be the way it was. And also... That's like thinking that if you go to the side of a giant highway with a bazillion trucks going by at like rush hour speed and you just went like this, that like the truck traffic would all stop and someone would come over and pick you up for a hitchhike. No, you pick the wrong area. You're not in a position to do that in that case. So in that scenario, they're not going to answer the call, put it that way. You have to develop these faculties to get to that point. That's why things like pathfinding, a path working rather are interesting. Go look up what that is. You'll think it's just imagination, but then it goes somewhere because what if the imagination isn't just a thing contained inside your head in nuts and bolts reality? As a certain occultist said, I think it was Don Milo Duquette, Lon Milo Duquette, it was, um, to have transposed that, Lon Milo Duquette had a concept that was like uh, the Neshamites, the idea that like your imagination is like, um, it is all in your head. It's just that everything in your head isn't just inside you. It's also like there's an overlap into the world, and whether that's an oversoul, a collective concept, whatever. Anyway, the point is, I'm not into the area, but my point is this. When you're going down that path, you have to commit to it. You have to give it belief. You have to not be cynical. You have to do what they say. You have to try things. And it'll take time. You won't just be instantly be able to try, like dabble and put my foot. Nah, I, didn't, I didn't like that. It doesn't work. So basically, I do think it's hard to get out of that, but I've just given you a sort of little key, haven't I? That could have been a mini thorn starts right there, but let's keep going. So then, because I was this guy, I mean, by the way, I even sort of LARPed when I watched this the first time. I even would like, once he started doing that thing, we started drinking around those episodes at the bike. I would like drink while I was watching it as well. Not all just alcohol. And then I would also do other things. I would sort of try to get into a crazy mindset and, and totally take in the experience and just immerse myself completely. This is one of those ones where you close the curtains, you turn off the lights, you're focused in on it, you, you make yourself comfortable. Again, it's why actually lying on a bed to watch a movie can be great, right? Because again, the body fades away. I was sitting back like this. Because you just want to immerse and, and go in, or rather it comes into whichever way. Maybe it's both. Maybe that's the interaction of art and the cinema screen, right? So what I would say is this. All of his rants against religion and stuff like that, I, I actually see as a bit too cynical now. At the time, I thought like some George Carlin, like, oh, nailed it. <laughs> Aren't they silly, these people thinking snake Christianity could do anything? It's like, yeah, but here's the thing, mate. Some of them are happy. They have lives. They have things they enjoy. They're actually getting joy out of their lives. They're doing the best things you can do, even if they're doing it in a fucked up way and getting scammed and having bad experiences. And what were you doing, mate? You were drinking and thinking about killing yourself or killing other people. And, and it was a bad... And at the end of the day, where did your philosophy take you? Exactly. That's one of the problems with this show. Is people are going to infer, well, since he's nailing all these great rants, he must be right and they're wrong. But it's like, look at his life. Is he right? I don't think so. He just had some really interesting observations. And we'll get to that later, won't we? So to me, I would just say a few angles for this is, there's a concept that prayer isn't about changing God in the world. It's about changing the one who's praying, right? You can say it's a way hypnotically to reframe yourself, to consider gratitude. That's a fantastic thing about prayer. It provides solace for people. Uh, it can build your confidence because you think someone's on your side or you've you've got something off your chest. It causes you to reflect or to meditate. I mean, prayer, the Western version that like actual um, monks used to do in cells in like monasteries back in the day, basically was meditation. That's just the, meditation is the Eastern version of it. That's the Orientalist version of it, isn't it? And this is the Western version of it. So as a result, like that's why those cells are a tiny place with nothing in it. And you just put like icons up, et cetera, and you spend all your time there and, and then you take vows of silence so you're just only thinking about your mental powers people don't understand there's an esoteric side to christianity guys it's not just like sufism and kabbalah from the islam and for judaism etc so already that in itself i'll say there's a little breadcrumb for you now look i also think some people do need guardrails quite frankly i'd love to think they wouldn't my mistake was being too egalitarian i thought everyone was like me and could be like me i don't think they can be i don't think they want to be i don't think it'd be good for them quite frankly so i think they do need guardrails i think some people will go mad if they attempt to sort of hack their own brain and start messing around with the BIOS of their system, as it were. Now, I'll just say this. Rust Cole should have just gotten another wife, had another kid, realised when it got to an institutional level, all this fucked up things. Just stay away from that, mate. Make sure it's not your kid that gets involved in that. 
protect them where possible, but have a good life. Like, is it worth giving everything up? Because the other thing about that example I gave before, but when you just say, right, I'm going to hurt everyone else, is there's also an aspect where it's like, that's the good thing, right? I'm going to sort of become the monster that can fight these monsters and kill them. But obviously the problem then is, as Nietzsche pointed out, what if you become the monster and then you can't not be the monster? Like people have gone to war and they come back. And by the way, here's a little secret. A lot of veterans supposedly don't tell you, as well as it being terrifying, some people say the reason why normie life back home never works again is because they're never as exhilarated and alive as they were in that moment and everything mattered and they had a purpose they were doing something they were fighting an existential war they were literally fighting life or death and then they come back and they're doot, doot. excuse me sir um we're just gonna need to uh call you and ask you to work overtime on t i know it's a difficult time but uh, here at the so-and-so wireless family we just appreciate that you are part of it you can't handle it you can't go back to that you can't go back to that in a world where now you're not even allowed to you have to press it all before you used to just get a machine gun Exactly. That's a different... You completely changed your world. You've become someone different at that point in time. The problem I have is this. Media forces and encourages through this type of art. You know, it's degenerate art, something I've gone more and more and more away from. Even though I can appreciate like beautiful writing or great cinematography, etc. The worst... They encourage the worst kind of emotional self-harm. It's actually a through line in Hollywood, you'll notice. Like, they make out like it's honourable to forever pine after that one love you had, as though there only can be one love. They make it seem like it's it's actually a noble thing to destroy yourself and your happiness because you experience terrible pain. You can never overcome it. How could you? Look, ruminate on it forever like this cool character does with all these, like, soaring fucking strings and stuff and this piano music and some sci-fi concept where they actually can't escape that because they're in the future in some way where there's only four people alive, but you're still in a world with loads of people. You could just go out the fucking door. Sun shining. Dogs are running by kids. <laughs> Grandma's, hey, come on then, Sonny. Your mates, you want to come for a drink? Let's have a chat. Oh, fuck. What about the, let's go hunting on the weekend. And then you're sat inside. Oh, this is, uh, I am the destroyer. This is, life is a nihilistic end of all that. We are just meat to a thresher. Like, it ain't. It's not, essentially, when I immerse myself, he's cool. When I come out of it, he's actually not cool. He's a very damaged person. I actually pity a lot. Now, you didn't expect all that, did you? Let's go to Woody Harrelson as Marty, shall we? This is a really weird one, because I really like Woody Harrelson as an actor. Not as much as Matthew McConaughey, but then again, I don't watch the rom-coms of Matthew McConaughey, so I'm probably biased in that sense. This is perfect casting for Woody Harrelson, because a lot of himself clearly is in there. If you watch interviews with this guy and you've known his career, he's a great straight man, to the esotericism and nihilism of Rust Call. It's kind of a balancing act going on there. Probably to keep people on the show who were normies and couldn't just handle how dark it gets otherwise. I also think you need both, sort of, in a way to get things done in the world. You just kind of do. It's why you never really can do it all yourself. You sort of, even if you're the guy who stands outside yourself, I'll give you the example of Gattaca. Spoiler, he never would have got away with it at the end unless what happened? Unless his brother... And that guy who was testing his piss, just normal people who aren't against the system, did a tiny act of disobedience because they saw what he was doing was bigger and more important and had a purpose and they just wanted to contribute to that. You always need that. Like in journalism, me and Richard Lewis in eSports stand apart from the others. We can't get it done without people inside these companies, inside these teams, other players, other people in the industry giving us information. And listen, I can't tell you, this is off the record. So I can't even speak about it publicly, but this is what's going on. And they still stay in. So look to me, they're in a way compromised. That's immoral or they might be dishonest. But I'll tell you what, we need them for people who are righteous like us, potentially, and sort of crusaders in a way, to actually get it done and to catch the bad guys or expose them. I'll also say this, and this is a very key point, that everyone I've ever seen comment on this show seems to miss. Because you love Woody Harrelson, he's an incredibly charismatic figure, and he's basically your pal when you watch the show if you identify with Russ Cole. What I don't get is this. It's weird how people consider Marty a good guy or a normal guy just because he helps Rust, and then he goes and, and they try to kill the diddler. Like, here's, this is how strange media is interpreted, because I'm going to remind you of some things in the season that I want you to think about that this character did, and you just saw it, cold water to your face, done in front of you. So he was constantly cheating on his wife, including with a young girl who he had in himself encountered because she had been abused and groomed slash conditioned, essentially, to perform sexual acts. And then he just exploited that, even though he's a, not only a man, a married man, an older man, a man in authority, but also someone who's supposed to protect those people in theory. But even worse, he has fucking children of his own. 
Like, bro, I can't believe people just thought that was fun. I know why, because you were titillated by what happened, weren't you? You thought Alexandra Daddario's tatas were shit. The shit, weren't they? So you never thought about the fact he was doing something immoral. Also, you thought when that blonde-haired girl called him and then said, oh, I've been thinking about you doing this. that was Maybe that was a fantasy for you. What gave you a thrill? Or you thought, oh, fuck, why don't these things happen to me? But you forget. In a way, this is real in your mind. And so your co-signing kind of fucked up behavior. Like these aren't the signs of someone with great moral strength and character. These aren't the signs of a good man. He might have done some good acts that in a sense redeemed him. But again, did they redeem his life? His life ends up a shithole. Even though, by the way, he's coming from the super normie angle. And part of it, you notice, and this is a very important point, is because they went down a rabbit hole. And even when they saw where the rabbit hole was headed, they kept going and kept going. As though at the end, they were going to kill all the diddlers. And somehow, it was going to be great and all sunshine and fucking butterflies and roses. And they could go back to that. You can't go back. You can change and become different. But you always have to integrate and reintegrate what you have taken on board now. And it will change you. That is the thing, it will change you. That's why I tell people there are certain rabbit holes you don't want to go down. There are things you cannot unsee. There are things that cannot be undone, even though you can become a different person and do and see other things. So here's another thing that I can't believe people don't mention. It's bonkers when you think of this character. How about that scene where his daughter is not like being raped or anything. She's just fucking around with some guys in a car. He goes there as a police officer. He brings those boys to a cell. He slowly puts on fucking gloves so he won't have fingerprints and he explains how, like, basically, there's two ways they can do it and then basically makes them take a fucking beating in a cell because they had the audacity to sleep with his... By the way, it's him who failed his daughter and didn't teach her good morals or what not to do or who not to be with. And set, By the way, it didn't set a fucking good example, did he? It's exactly the sort of woman who goes out there and does stupid things that are... Because look at the example of her father. By the way, how else can she get her father's attention too? So he does that heinous thing, an absolute crime and abuse of authority, bro, and everyone's just cool with that, because at the end, he's killing evil people, people who kill evil people aren't always good guys, in fact, that's one of the points I've just tried to make about the extremes of the spectrum, now, here's the thing, the show itself is incredibly compelling, it's intriguing, it's mysterious in the right ways, it actually intentionally doesn't explain certain things, which is better for the mystery, the pacing is great, it goes between the large and the small, and it never makes you feel like some shows do, where they just drip feeding you the large, and it's all about the small and the day to day. No, it's got a really good bit, balance between the two, and it doesn't have filler, quite frankly. It's got some really nice through lines in the plot, references and callbacks to other things. It's got some mega striking scenes, iconic moments. Think about that scene with the graffiti on the church when it's revealed, right? When they watch that video towards the end, will you ever forget that scene? How about the scene with the big bad when they properly encounter him? And then obviously, I saved it to last, that biker episode, the undercover one, might be the best episode of TV ever. Like that one episode there is like, why even make Sons of Anarchy, mate? I know I think I actually came Sons of Anarchy before, but like that one episode is better than everything that was like that. <laughs> it's better than like Walking Dead, all of that shit. That one episode, that's fucking, that could be a movie. It's unbelievable. Now here's the issue. The ending, this is another flaw. The ending, the last episode, I find very unsatisfying. Right? First of all, the main bad guy is absurd, and I think that was intentional, not only to give a flourishing, because that's actually an underrated character actor, but also to make it like, well, of course, in the real world, it just they couldn't really exist, people who did shit like that and were evil, so let's make him silly like a fucking movie. That's like one of those absurd, like, bad guys in old school comics, like, I'm just evil. It's like, oh, that's just shit. And then he's the big bad. I mean, he isn't. If you watch the show, he isn't the big bad. He's actually essentially the Patsy of the Fall guy that they just knock off like, oh, well, that's all we could get done. We just did all this and ruined our whole lives and relationships. But yeah, we, we murked this one guy and he almost murked you. Like, well, brilliant, that was worth it. And they think that's satisfying. I don't find it satisfying at all. Like, all they can do, remember, this is a conclusion, is get him. And then once they get him, they do, all right, load up, get fucking machine guns, get more people like us when they take this whole network. No, because they know you can't. They know you can't. I mean, they're even being bloody investigated, which is the whole point of how the, that method of them talking to the camera and those cops comes about, right? And it is implied that there is a huge network in their area going across all levels of the state. And by the way, consider what that infers about the rest of the world they live in. People don't think about this scope. The turn, by the way, where it's sort of like you find hope is mega unconvincing and forced, in my opinion. Look, in the moment, you sort of do what you can to swallow it. You're like, yeah, I guess I wanted there to be something at the end because we didn't get the whole network. But it's actually, it doesn't. 
It just happens instantly. It's like an instant conversion. It, doesn't, it just doesn't work for me. And by the way, nobody, when they watch this show, nobody in life in general, in fact, a lot of the people who buy the occult books, nobody takes the occult seriously. Like, there was a concept someone made to me. I talked about this in the Jason Horsley one, where it made me suddenly have an epiphany, like, holy fuck. So there's a concept that all modern religious traditions and secret societies, mainly secret societies and occult things I'm talking about, they never go where we were started in, you know, 1898 or 1924 or 1905. They go, yeah, that's when, um, like, they rediscovered these scrolls or this ancient truth, and they reconnected with the secret master and we're told like all the things to do and so we connect back to Egypt and Babylon and Sumer and all and uh, Rome and all that they they do that or the Eleusinian mysteries but I always used to think well if you look into it you find out it's forged didn't it it's faked and they were lying and they just wanted to seem cooler it's a bit like when people join Counter-Strike clans years later when the name's cool but it's none of the original players and you're like should you even be using that name isn't that someone else's name but they just want the status initially before their name is known right the issue I have is this because no one ever actually stops and looks at that stuff and considers, what if it was real, what they're saying? Well, the premise would go, if there were disincarnate entities who are in the physical realm and potentially exist outside of time, then you wouldn't need to actually, for real, have a nuts and bolts connection to old scrolls and things. Couldn't, if you communicated with them, wouldn't they be able to download you the data, as it were? Like having an internet connection and downloading it from across the ocean from somewhere at that point in time. You wouldn't have to physically meet them. They can send you it, right? But again, people don't actually consider, what if what we're that's real? They automatically assume it isn't, and therefore this is all fake and a front. Because obviously the front is, this is just about diddling kids and being evil. But was it? I mean, it was implied, if you listen to some of the parts they don't explain to keep it mysterious, that it was actually about affecting time or gaining some sort of occult energy in this world, harvesting energy by the way, Gorkin and things like Voodoo and what, how fucking dark that is. Manifesting reality, accessing the future potentially. That method guy's basically implying he's sort of seen the future. That's why time is a flat circle. He already knows about Carcosa, even though that's at the end of the show. People don't stop and think about what, because what they do is they drip feed you the limited hangout of that and then they pull you right back out and then they forget about it and you only re reference it vaguely at the end and they never quite explain what happened in that scenario didn't what was that all about you get to know the real one you know, don't you? but you don't get to know the bigger thing of what was the occult thing what were they doing in those what were, what were those symbols about by the way those symbols are breadcrumb themselves go and have a look into it then there's that whole thing it's basically this show uh, it's a it's a towering institutional corruption you're shown that cannot be overcome i mean look at the cost of trying to get in one guy who's at the bottom of the network in it Rust has to fucking go undercover in a biker meth gang and almost die to get through this shit and get one guy. The show works like a limited hangout, which puts you off ever looking into or considering the topics at hand as real or something that could happen or has happened. Yet, I'll just say this. Your instincts tell you there's a visceral truth to it, right? That's why there is a horror element. That's why something is unsettling about it. That's why there's something about it where you want it to be that they got him and that he's right that you turn to the good. And... Because intuitively, don't you sort of know it? It feels real. And then there's obviously this issue. I've mentioned it on something inside, but this is one of the reasons I want to make this video. I'm just saying all this hypothetically, but essentially there's an aspect of it that just seems like plagiarism. And I mean that in this sense. As I'll get to later, I'm fine with people cribbing from stuff in the past, aping it, doing homages, taking elements of it and doing collage. Some of my favorite artists do that, even in the modern day. My problem is when you do that, you clearly took something. Sometimes you don't even change it that much, so you make it like an homage, but then you don't make it an homage because you never like thank them in the credits, in an interview. You pretended it was yours, and then when you were caught, you're like, oh yeah, of course, I just liked that. It was cool, wasn't it? So if you look up, I'm going to link it in the description box below. There's a website called Lovecraft Zine. So obviously people who like Lovecraft also like stuff like Robert Chambers and some of the other stuff that I think predated him maybe. And it basically is called, Did the Writer of True Detective Plagiarize Thomas Ligotti and Others? Now the aforementioned writer is Nick Pizzolato and he openly acknowledges the influence of Thomas Ligotti who wrote The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, great horror book, and Robert W. Chambers, The Yellow King, and obviously The Car Corsa. I mean, here's a quote from an interview. More recently, this is him, Nick, Nick Pizzolato. More recently, I'd point people in the direction of Thomas Ligotti, Laird Barron, John Langan, Simon Strantzas, and others. For fans of the show who'd like to see what contemporary voices have done with Chambers, King in Yellow, I'd point them toward Carl Edward Wagner's short story, the rivers, the river of night streaming, or the recent anthology, a season in Carcosa. Now, 
he admits that he's read the conspiracy against the human race. He even says, I read the conspiracy against the human race and found it incredibly powerful writing. For me as a reader, it was less impactful as philosophy than as one writer's ultimate confessional, an absolute horror story where the self is the monster. In episode one of True Detective, there are two lines in particular, and it would have been nothing to reword them, but you didn't, cunt. You just took someone else's great turns of phrases and used them. But you could have, but you didn't. So I'm just going to say that there. That was me inserting in square brackets, editor. <laughs> that were specifically phrased in such a way as to signal Ligotti admirers, which of course you got. Now here's what's funny. The Lovecraft Dean claims, and if this is the case, suddenly what he just said becomes a bit disingenuous. It says, to date, Pizzolatto has only acknowledged Ligotti when he is directly asked about him. In other words, when he has no choice. And apparently that was after episode three had come out. Otherwise, when they ask him about like influence, he's saying like Nietzsche and obviously things like the King in Yellow. So, but he's not saying Thomas Ligotti because Thomas Ligotti is sort of an obscure horror writer in terms of, the, it's not Stephen King, is it? And then also later on, when he's going to rip off Alan Moore, it's a really obscure Alan Moore comic. The most Alan Moore fans haven't read. I have, because I'm, I'm an aficionado of Alan Moore, as you will know. So that's already interesting. So what I'll do is I'll give you some examples. And by the way, I'm not going to tell you what to do. But I think if you actually want to enjoy this video and consider this seriously, don't fight and just decide, unless this is exact, then it's not in any way lifted or plagiarized. Or don't imply, because you slightly reworded it, like, it's fine to do that. It's like, come up with your own ideas, cunt. You know what I mean? So I'll just put that out there. You, you buy, your brain will fight because you love the show. I did as well. I still do. So here's the quotes. I'm going to do what? It'll go from Rust Colt, to all his philosophy, by the way. And then it'll go into the quotes from the other books. So Rust Colt says... We became too self... This is, by the way, this is... I'd say this stuff is the definition of that meme of like, well, okay, you can copy my homework, but change it a bit, will you? And they haven't changed it enough is the joke. So Cole goes, we became too self-aware. Nature created an aspect of nature separate from itself. We are the creatures that should not exist by natural law. And then The Conspiracy Against the Human Race by Thomas Ligotti. We know that nature has veered into the supernatural by fabricating a creature that cannot and should not exist by natural law, natural law and yet does. Rust Call. We are things that labor under the illusion of having a self. Each of us programmed with a total assurance that we're somebody when in fact everybody is nobody. Conspiracy Against the Human Race. And the worst thing we could know Worse than knowing of our descent from a mass of microorganisms is that we are nobodies, not somebodies, puppets, not people. Then also from the same one later, everybody is nobody. From the same novel later, our captivity is the illusion of a self, even though there is no one to have this illusion. Later on, the illusion of being a somebody among somebodies, as well as for the substance we see or think we see in the world. Rust Cole. I think human consciousness is a tragic misstep in evolution. Conspiracy against the human race. Human existence is a tragedy that need not have been were it not for the intervention in our lives of a single calamitous event, the evolution of consciousness, parent of all horrors. By the way, he's just doing a shittier version of those lines, by the way, and poorly masking them. Another one, same, not, same book. The evolutionary mutation of consciousness tugged us into tragedy. Same novel, our captivity in the illusion of a self, the tragedy of the ego. Back to Rust Call. The only honourable thing for our species to do is to deny our programming, stop reproducing and march hand in hand into extinction. We're fucking hero, guys. Conspiracy against the human race. The human race will never do the honourable thing and abort itself later on. To this end, to end this self-deception, we must cease reproducing. Later on the same page. And how many would speed up the process of extinction once the euthanasia was decriminalized and offered in humane and even enjoyable ways? By the way, something I think about in real life there. I live in a certain country. Rust Cole. I think about the hubris it must take to yank a soul out of non-existence into this meat. Force a life into this thresher. Conspiracy against the human race. Whatever else we may be as creatures that go to and fro on the earth and walk up and down on it, we are meat. Later on, oh, same novel, but another quote. We, why should generations unborn be spared entry into the human thresher? Same novel, next page. Non-existence never hurt anyone, and existence hurts everyone. Same novel later. Every one of us, having been stolen from non-existence, opens his eyes on this world and looks down at the road at a few convulsions and a final obliteration. 
same novel a few pages earlier, this new Adam and Eve are only being readied for the meat grinder of existence. Back to Rust Cole. It's all one gutter, man. A giant gutter in outer space. Now from The Frolic by Thomas Ligotti. In the black forming gutters and back alleys of paradise, in the dank windowless gloom of some galactic cellar, in the hollow pearly halls found in sewer-like seas, in starless cities of insanity and in their slums. By the way, Thomas Ligotti shits on this fucking cunt. Rust Cole. And other times, I thought I was seeing straight into the true heart of things. Conspir conspiracy against the human race on Conrad's heart of darkness. Horrible inner truth of things. Rust call. So my daughter, she spared me from the sin of being a father. Conspiracy against the human race. Non-coital existence. The surest path to redemption for the sin of being congregants of this world. Guys, the worst one is still to come. It is when the, cl the iconic ending speech is taken almost theme for theme and sometimes word for word from an obscure Alan Moore comic. It's in the series called Top 10, which was about all these people where everyone's a superhero, except this one, it's actually a banger, go read it, but it's more of like a, it's like a TV show, it's not like a full-on movie, like super mega work of Alan Moore's. Issue 8, and by the way, I noticed this guy likes to make his sources that he really cribs from, quite obscure, suspiciously, so then people wouldn't know, wouldn't call him out for it. And here's the quote from... Um, Rust Cole in the show. At the end, him and Marty, remember, they're sat there and they're looking up at the sky. I just come out of the coma and he goes, there's just one story, the oldest. What's that? Light versus dark. Well, I know we ain't in Alaska, but it seems to me that the dark has a lot more territory. Yeah, you're right about that. You're looking at it the wrong way. The sky. How's that? Once there was only dark. If you ask me, the light's winning. Now here's Alan Moore in top 10. Existence is a great simplicity. There is black and there is white. So big guy, what is it? This black and white, this great black white stuff. Just look above you. Do you see? That is called the immense board of lights. And there is a great black and strewn across it. Small and surrounded and vulnerable and brave. There is the great white. Oh, oh yeah, of course. Ha, you know, that's perfect. That's really perfect. And the great white, I mean, there's so much more black out. Are, are we losing? No. Once there was only black, we are winning. All is right. We can go. Just a fucking better version of the shit he did. Because he took someone else's and digested it like a human centipede and put shit out of his ass. But like corn, some of it remained. Some of the fire still got through. Then also, he even admits he's read Alan Moore comics. Doesn't reference that fucking comic, I'll notice. It goes, I've never really researched all of it, to be fair. This is early on. The first time, as an interview, I got excited about writing was reading comics by Alan Moore and Grant Morrison as a kid. Growing up in southwest Louisiana, in a house without many books. Yeah, it sounds like you already had three books, mate. You just fucking did your whole career off them. The sophistication and depth of their stories was really mind-blowing for a kid. That's an interview he gave with Louisiana, Louisville, Louisville Courier Journal in 2010. Okay, quite interesting. So he's already acknowledged he's read Alan Moore. It was influential on him. And Grant Morrison too. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, another obscure work of Alan Moore's is some of his stuff for very, very indie comics, not Marvel and DC, which is The Courtyard Near Nomicon Before Providence. It's basically his take on Lovecraft and his own homage, but he's open about it. A guy called Kyle Pinion wrote an article for Geek Rex that discusses some of the similarities between the stories, respective plots, and protagonists. Pinion writes, from a purely plot-driven angle, it's hard to deny that Alan Moore's The Court, I've read this by the way, it's very similar, in terms of the themes you'll get to, may be where we find some of the biggest echoes to the story Pizzolato is crafting. In Alan Moore's 1994 story, a prose tale later adapted into a comic in 2003, it was actually written as prose text, we meet Detective Aldo Sachs, 
Sachs is an FBI agent specializing in anomaly theory, wherein he collates seemingly unrelated data, think of the fucking theme of Russ Cole, into a specified whole. Sachs's strange methods cast him as an outsider within the rest of the Bureau, but his methods prove effective. The main thrust of the courtyard details Sachs's attempts to investigate three seemingly unrelated murders across the US. This eventually leads him to a young man who deals a drug called Aklo, the after effects of which are shockingly similar to the reported actions of the three different murderers. After Sachs meets with this dealer, he quickly learns that Aklo isn't a drug at all, but a language. It's almost Boros-esque, isn't it? When the dealer speaks it to him, it drives him mad, thrusting him on a crass crash course tour of the various realms of Lovecraftian mythos. These visions eventually drive Sachs to murder his neighbour in the exact same fashion as the crimes he was investigating. Does this sa at all sound familiar? In terms of how flashback Cole and his modern day form both appear, it's easy to draw parallels between the characterization and the psychological path that both Cole and Sachs took. While we still don't know why Cole appears so dishevelled now, we also don't know how he transformed from a sceptic to a seeming believer in the most esoteric ideas that his suspects were spouting off. But there are similarities between Cole and Aldo, initial high-functioning intellect slash low social skills protagonists who are driven to some form of mental impairment slash self-destruction, and it's possible the courtyard provided some basis of inspiration, though I highly doubt we'll be seeing true detective veer into the realm of the fantastic. It's actually one of the things I've sort of called out. Then how about some Grant Morrison? Pinion also notes that True Detective mentions M-theory. If you've read The Invisibles, you're going to know what this is. And suggests that this uses an idea from Grant Morrison's Invisible series. That's from the fucking 90s, guys, if you don't know. Since that's where Pinion first learned about the concept. Pinion writes, Cole made mention of M-theory and began to describe the concept to his inqu to inquisitors. Immediately, I knew that sounded familiar, as what he began to describe was very similar to a concept I learned about through Grant Morrison's The Invisibles. Pause. Well, we know that this guy already read Grant Morrison in the 90s, presumably. In simple terms, the theory works thusly. While time is linear for us as three-dimensional beings, by the way, this is actually the main philosophy in the occult as well of Alan Moore now, beings of a higher dimension would see us as two-dimensional and would be able to view our past and our future at the same time, not unlike looking at a map or flipping the pages of a comic book. Cole describes what we see as a sphere, which appears as a flat circle Time flat circle as a flat circle to those beings that are beyond us. If you're contacting via these rituals, some sort of being like a macroscopic being instead of the microscopic looking into a smaller world. Interesting breadcrumbs everywhere on this one, boys. It's a heady concept that's been floating around cosmological circles since 1983 and perhaps earlier. And while its multiversal antecedents have existed in science fiction for decades via string theory. The theory itself, to this extent, rarely appeared in pop culture other than in Morrison's Watershed series. By the way, that's probably Grant Morrison's most famous thing. I mean, in the modern day, maybe it's actually All-Star Superman, but it should be. It's his masterwork. Here's the problem I have. You judge for yourself if you think there's anything there. I'll say this. It's a bit suspicious that nothing else this fuck has ever written since has come close to like the gravitas, the fucking turns of phrase, the genius concepts of that season one, where it seems like he heavily cribbed from others, doesn't it? He wrote episodes, guys, in season two and season three. This is actually reminiscent of another set of people. One day, I might do one about the Wachowskis and the Invisibles, because that one would fucking blow your mind. But I'll need some visual effects for that one. Reminiscent of when they made The Matrix, which everyone loved, kind of like I love this first season. But then you look, it's got a lot of stuff from other places. But then the sequels are garbage, but they wrote the sequels because the sequels don't have any of that stuff from those sources. So the sequels are just the authors and they're not fucking very good of this movie. By the way, it's why the Wachowski's other best film is from a fucking book. It's Cloud Atlas. And by the way, Jupiter Ascending or whatever it is, they can also be hacks. They're like Nicolas Cage. They can be amazing, but they can be fucking hacks too. Tarantino is where I'm going to start a different part of this conversation to end with, though, which is I do think you can be a genius that steals as opposed to the artist that borrows. This fucker just borrowed and took it. And Stealing is when you take it, but then they don't. You took it. It's yours now. It's mine now. You do it with your you do it with yourself and, through, and then reinterpret it through a genius. It becomes better. That's the key thing. When you're stealing your genius, you make it better. When you borrow and you're just good, 
you make it worse or it's, it can't ever go above the bar of where it was before because you're not as good as that artist. So it's essentially, everyone should know, Tarantino stands about pastiche. He's a massive fan of film, especially independent and foreign film and, and fucking pop film. And as a result, a lot of his work is a pastiche of styles and scenes and themes and, and even the music of all these past films that he's trying to build together to make something cool and different out of. And he's very good at it. And I don't consider him a rip-off merchant. Noel Gallagher, one of my favourite songwriters, steals hooks and melodies from the 70s and the rock era he was into and pop, and he makes them his own and makes them better and writes better lyrics to them. Probably the best example ever is Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin did go and absolutely take some old blues songs. Some of them even call the same. So they're all marginal in that sense. But they didn't pay royalties is the problem, I believe, in licensing, which is the issue I think is the problem. I can't, I've never fully looked into that one. But the problem is this. There's a better, their versions of, you can go listen to some of the old versions of Robert Johnson. It's not as good, mate. You're not going to enjoy it the same way. Theirs is better because their musicianship is better. So they're able to elevate it and do something more with it and transmute it. If you ever want to look, though, into the idea of like, why so many um, mainstream media artists seem to steal and then sometimes make things worse. I'll just give one breadcrumb. There's a book by a guy called Dave McGowan about a place called Laurel Canyon. That's all I'll say. This is why, in my opinion, the later seasons are much less interesting. Season two had moments due to the acting performances of the big two male actors. It was kind of keen but it was also way less interesting. And all the occult stuff was just a red herring. It just aped it and there never really was much going on there. I was never satisfied. And even worse, it couldn't be satisfying because when you hear there was going to be a season two, you hope it's about Rustin Marty, don't you? By the way, this is a classic like bait and switch I've seen before. My favourite book used to be Robert Anton Wilson, Cosmic Trigger, part one. The like true real secret of the Illuminati or something like that. But the problem is that's like essentially like a biography. And then there's a there's a there's a second and third book. So you think, fuck, I love this. I can't wait for it. But then they're just like essays or anecdotes. And it's not at all the same when you feel ripped off like, oh, I thought there was like two more books of this. Same with this. You wish there was a season two and season three that were awesome, like season one, there isn't. And as a result, I'm not that interested. Season two was all right. I'm not that interested in season three and season four. They're just diminishing returns. And I'll just say, I think it's because of some of the things I mentioned in this video. Obviously, my main gig is over in esports on my main channel. But my side channel and all my content around my other interests here are kindly supported by my Patreon community on Thorin's side here. So do you want to ask me a question for my video AMA? Do you want to take part in a private one-on-one -on -one exclusive, never to be released but recorded for you session? Call it consulting. Call it just a conversation if you want. Do you want to find out who upcoming guests guests are for the Thor Inquiry episodes. If any or other perks like this take your interest, check out the Patreon link in the description box below and join Thor inside today.